Love, joy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is from Matthew 19, starting at verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's the text. We're going to start out with a little bit of a mind bender this morning. I want you to look at each word in a short video and speak out loud the color of the word. Not the word, the color of the word. So, you ready? Let's go. In all honesty, I'm having a little uh, vertigo stuff going on here. I cannot even look at it. I, I, I can't. Uh, not that easy, right? In, in case you're interested, it's called the Stroop Effect, after the first warped and twisted guy who thought of this exercise. The interference with the two different sets of information causes your brain to have a bit of a problem processing what you see. Even when you don't have to make the snap decision, it still takes quite a bit longer to read a set like this than if each word were to match its color. And there are all kinds of psychological uses they use this test for that we won't get into this morning. The point I want to make simply is that we tend to get used to seeing things in a certain way. And sometimes we need to see things in a different way in order to really process the information that can change our lives. And that's what I want to do with this Journeys with the Messiah series from Michael Belk. And I appreciate very much the dialogue that we've had so far in this series and allowing us to use some of his pictures in this Lenten season. He's posed the first century Jesus with 21st century people, and it, it just does something different, I think, to the way in which you see Jesus. And I would say to you, let that happen for you in this series. Let these pictures that we're going to look at stretch you and challenge you and allow you to picture yourself with Jesus. I thought today's picture was especially interesting because since you've seen his little introductory video, I thought it, it really seemed to reflect Michael Belk's personal journey among the rich and famous. And I asked him about it, and this was his email reply this week. He says, as I have learned over time, I am, most of us are, the person in all the images. 
when I was successful in the world's eyes, but failing the plan God had for me, I was asked, if you could be anything, what would it be? I said I would want to have the characteristics of Jesus, that I want to be humble and peaceful. I'm convinced that any, everyone would enjoy life more if when they looked in the mirror, or if, they, if when they look in the mirror and what they are reflecting to others looks like Jesus. I hope that gives you some insight into where Belk is coming from with these pictures and really where I'm going with this sermon series. So let's take a look, a hard look at today's picture, which is really to look at, I think, this reading from Matthew. The picture shows a rich young man who seems to have it all. He's the classic New Testament yuppie. He's got the Ferrari. By the way, you can go, well, no. You can't get that whole story in the uh, out or in the uh, promo video on his website. He has a website, journeyswiththemessiah.org. Another, by the way, if any of these pictures that we're doing in this series hits you in a powerful way, you can go on that website and get the prints. I think each of the prints are $65. Uh, I decided not to buy them all and display them because it was a little bit more expensive than I wanted to, but uh, you can do that if, if any of them strikes you in a, in a certain way. But if you get into the coffee table book, you can read a little bit more about this picture. But in the video, he talks a lot more about it. In the longer video that I have, you could borrow if, if you want. We'll probably end up putting it in a library. Anyway, this Ferrari got impounded because the guy that was supposed to bring it onto the set, well, it is a Ferrari. And he uh, turned it loose and got caught. <laughs> Fortunately, the mayor of the city was being interviewed at the same time on the set, and he pulled some strings and got him released and, and got the Ferrari back. So he's got the Ferrari, he's got the good looks, he's got the nice companion, and by the way, it looks like he really is an all-around good guy, that he didn't step on people to get where he is, but he's still missing something. He's in a quandary, wondering if there isn't something more to life. So he makes his way to Jesus, who seems to have the answers, and he presents his question, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life. He thinks he can get eternal life in the same way he's gotten everything else by his actions. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? He literally is a self-made man, which is great in man's eyes, but not in God's. Elsewhere, Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, not works, but believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. I love how Jesus is posed in this picture with his arms outstretched and full of what he wants to give to this rich young man. If only he would stop hiding behind his Ferrari, his stuff, himself. And so Jesus' first response is intended to show the rich young man that he's wrong in thinking he has something to offer God by which he could get eternal life like he got everything else. So he directs him to the commandments. If you want to be perfect, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And Now folks, anyone who is not blinded by himself and his stuff would immediately realize he couldn't do it. It would be a hopeless attempt. I've tried and failed. Instead, the guy grabs a piece of paper and pencil and asks for the list. And he starts checking it out. Well, you know, which ones? So Jesus tries to give him another chance to open his eyes to his sin, and he gives him a partial list. No problem, says the yuppie, as he checks it off. Haven't murdered anyone lately? Adultery? Well, nothing worth mentioning. Stealing? Maybe a little wheeling and dealing, all justifiable. False testimony, eh, depends on your definition. Honor your father and your mother, sure, I still see him on holidays. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, uh, sure. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? I mean, how, how Jesus could keep from laughing is beyond me at that point. I would have said, honesty. You lack honesty. Because any of us would understand, if we're honest, that we can't keep those commandments. The words of Jesus that really were intended to bring the rich young ruler to his knees only puff him up even more. But I love the comment Mark adds here in his gospel. He says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Despite his blindness to his own sin and need of forgiveness, he loved him. Well, folks, if that's true, then why did Jesus give him such a harsh, uncompromising answer? Why doesn't he try to work with him gently and ease him into the kingdom? Instead, he says, all right, if you really want to enter the kingdom, sell it all. You'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. I think the answer is that Jesus does not love in a Mortimer milk toast kind of way. He loved that rich man enough to answer his question with the truth. The rich young man had asked, what do I still lack? Jesus told him basically his answer was, you lack the ability to see beyond yourself and your stuff. Your stuff has become more important to you than me. Unless that changes, I can't help you. Jesus put that man on the razor's edge of the most important decision of his life. And I wonder how you or I would have responded. Who are rich beyond most of the world's wildest dreams, all of us. I can't resist a little excursus here that I think might help. Remember the movie Groundhog Day? How many of you watched that movie? That deeply theological movie that I've threatened for years I'm going to do a Bible study with? My family has watched that movie over and over and over every year around Groundhog Day for 21 years. In honor of the theme of that movie, where the weatherman Phil is called upon to go down to Punxsutawney and cover the annual Groundhog Day Festival. You know, they pull out the groundhog, he sees his shadow, he doesn't see his shadow. It's fun, but it's all just a big joke to him. He thinks he's far more important than, you know, to go down to this hick town and do something so stupid. When he's down there, something strange happens. He ends up living Groundhog Day in Punxsutawney, over and over and over again until he's absolutely sick of it. And after a while, he discovers that nothing he does matters anyway. So he lives a number of days in a wild debauch, stealing money, setting up one-night stands with women and so on. But no matter how many desires he satisfies, he's still not happy. What would you do if you were stuck in one place? and every day was exactly the same, and nothing that you did mattered. That about sums it up for me. And unfortunately, that about sums it up for many people in this world, and many people in your life, who truly have no idea why they've been put on the face of this earth. They don't know what they're here for. And so this deeply theological movie attempts to answer this question, this quandary. And it really is like Solomon in Ecclesiastes, who uses his great wisdom, the greatest, the smartest man the world has ever seen, and does the dumbest thing anyone could ever do. He tries to find meaning in life every other way than through others and through God. And the conclusion is inevitable. The conclusion Solomon makes is meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. <laughs> now, according to experts who obviously have way too much time on their hands and have actually analyzed deeply 
the days of the Groundhog movie, Phil was trapped on that same day for, anybody want to guess how long? Eight years, eight months, and 16 days. As I said, they have way too much time on their hands. Until he finally changed his approach and decided that instead of living for himself, he was going to live for others. And so he discovered everything bad that happened in the town, and since it happened the same time in the same way and the same day, that's not all that hard to do. And he turns it all around. Kid falls out of a tree. He's there to catch him. Guy chokes in the restaurant. He's there to do the Heimlich, and on and on. And finally he ends up living totally for that town. And in one day, he becomes the most popular and loved man in Punxsutawney and the most happy. Can't show you the whole thing, but take a partial look at the happy ending. Well, of course he gets the girl, too. It's that nice young man from the Motor Club. Thank you again. It's nothing, ladies. He's the fastest Jack in Jefferson County. <laughs> what was that all about? I really don't know. They've been hitting on me all night. There you are. I never thanked you properly for what you did for Buster. Look, he would have choked for sure. Well, he may have. He was trying to swallow a whole cow. <laughs> I owe you one, buddy. Hang on to him, dear. He's a real find. <laughs> what did you do today? Oh, same old, same old. Same old, same old. Mr. Connors. Hey, Fred, how was the wedding? Well, I just wanted to thank you for making Debbie go through with it and everything. All I did was fan the flame of her passion for you, Fred. <laughs> you are the best. No, you are the best. Rita, this is Debbie and Fred Kleiser. Hi! Here you go, kids. Congratulations. What is this? No way. No way! WrestleMania! No way! <laughs> I can't really see Russell being here. We're like gonna be in Pittsburgh anyway. Thank you, Mr. Connors. You're a real pal. Oh, this is Russell. <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, yeah, I guess not. How does everyone know you? I mean, you only come here once a year, and you you seem like the most popular person in town. Excuse me? Yes. Dr. Connors? Yes. I want to thank you for fixing Felix's back. Oh. He can even help around the house again. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Felix. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Connors? It's kind of an honorary title. What is going on? I really don't know. No, there is something going on with you. Would you like the long version or the short one? Let's start with the short and go from there. I'd love to show you more, but, uh, you know, we have it. If you want to check it out from my home library, that's fine. Fun movie. It has the happy ending that I personally need to have in movies. The point is, he's finally figured it out. It's not about him. 
Unfortunately, in life, you don't always get a do-over. and You don't always have a happy ending. Which brings us back to the rich young man and one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. When he heard this challenge from Jesus, he simply wasn't up to it. Went away sad. Folks, I think it's important to note that the Word of God, even if it comes from the lips of Jesus Christ, does not always produce immediate results. On the other hand, the seed of God's Word went with him and perhaps in time bore fruit. We don't know. Later, Jesus took the opportunity to explain this encounter to the disciples. He said, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man. Again, I tell you, all of us by the world's standards are in that category. Hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. A while back, I read a commentary that was meant to try and make that phrase easier to understand. Apparently, when entering many of the eastern walled cities, they had a small portal through which you could enter. And a camel could not enter with packs on its back, right? So, but if you took the packs off and, and got it to sort of kneel down, it could scooch into the city. And, you know, there's attractive parts to that explanation, but the more I researched the text itself, the more clear it became that Jesus was speaking of an actual camel and an actual needle. And this text is to be understood as the disciples understood it. They realized it was impossible, and it didn't seem fair. And then Jesus explained it. You're right. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And that's the key to this whole passage, and we know it, but we continually forget it and need to be reminded, we cannot save ourselves. And unless we're willing to come to grips with that and turn our backs on anything that would keep us from Jesus Christ, we cannot truly see Him as our Savior, who all along has been looking on us and loving us and wanting to give us all His love and lead us into a life beyond our wildest dreams. When we get that message, we need to go away. I pray that you go away from this place today. Not sad, but convicted and convinced that what we really wish for and need in life is not our stuff or ourselves, but simply to follow Jesus. May God help you on that journey for Jesus' sake. Amen. May the peace of God, which is so great that it passes our ability even to understand it, Keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.